project, your first milestone for your project, is due on Wednesday. So you will submit that on Wednesday by 4 p.m. Um, please, for, so for each group, just uh, submit one copy of the proposal. So don't, if you're in a group of three, that's just one, not three proposals. And you're going to submit it the same place you submit your homeworks to Mallory by 4 p.m. in hard copy. You're also going to email one digital copy, a PDF, to the TAs. So that's all on the instructions for the milestone. Are there any questions about the milestone or the submission process for that? OK, you also have a homework coming up, so make sure that you're, I mean, due date coming up. The homework's been released last week, so make sure you're looking at that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's due a week from tomorrow, I think. Any other questions before we start? OK, one thing I wanted to say about the scribes. Um, the scribes, by the way, you should be submitting them to Mattia. I don't know if we put that on the website, but people seem to figure that out. Mattia is in charge of the scribe notes uh, this semester. And if you're assigned to scribe a particular lecture, so that means you're supposed to scribe the content of that lecture. So for example, if you were scribed to, if you were assigned to scribe the subgradient method lecture, then you should also be writing this down. Because we didn't quite finish the stochastic part um, from last Wednesday. Okay, so the, so the people who were signed up for the subgradient method lecture were responsible for this like 10 minutes. People who are doing the proximal gradient lecture, you're not responsible for this part, just to, to clear that up. So we're going to, um, I wanted to cover the stochastic subgradient method just in a little more detail. We kind of rushed through it at the end last time. It's a, a very widely used technique in large scale optimization in machine learning and statistics. Um, hopefully we'll revisit it as an advanced topic later in the course. This is just to give you a flavor of what, um, of what it was. So let's just jump right in. Um, the setting, member was to minimize the sum of functions. And we thought of a few cases where this could be interesting. Say in regression, each of these fi's look like, so I would call x beta in regression, right? And each of these fi's might look like the uh, yi minus xi transpose beta squared, where xi is our predictive variable and yi is our response. And m is n in that setting, so we're summing up um, the, law, the, the squared error loss on each of n training examples. The same holds with classification and also, um, you know, kind of regression classification with different losses than the, the ones that you kind of most typically encounter, like the logistic and least squares loss. We can very typically write this as the sum over training examples of some loss in that training example. And we're in a setting where we're imagining that m, which is the number of training examples we can keep in our mind, right, m equals n in most of our applications, is very large, large enough that Forming this sum is, is challenging. Maybe even storing all the data in memory is challenging as well. So what would subgradient method do to minimize this sum of, uh, of functions, sum of convex functions? Well, remember, the, the subgradient method just computes a subgradient at every iterate. So if we're at xk minus 1, we, we compute a subgradient of the loss of the criterion function at xk minus 1. And we know that the subgradient of a sum um, we can take as sums of subgradients. That was one of our rules. So in other words, we have to compute the subgradient of each of these uh, fi's, I'm calling that gi, and evaluate it at, at the point xk minus 1. That's why there's a superscript k minus 1 here. And we just move in that direction. right? In, this, in the case where these functions were differentiable, this would be a sum of gradients moving in the, the direction that's defined by the sum of their gradients. So that could be very costly because m could be large. right? It could actually be very costly just to perform this update. So an alternative approach is to do something that people call stochastic or incremental subgradient method, which a special case of that is stochastic gradient descent or incremental gradient descent when these functions are all differentiable. And that repeats the following. It just chooses one of the elements of that sum in some way, and we take the subgradient with respect to that function and move in that direction. That's the difference. Okay, and, and there are typically two ways to choose which element of the sum um, to move along. 
in terms of its subgrading or its gradient in each direction, at each iteration. And that's to do it cyclically, so where we kind of take each one in turn. We ask for the subgrading of the first function, the second function, the third function, et cetera, and we cycle back over iterations. That's called the cyclic rule. The randomized rule, on the other hand, just chooses a function uniformly at random from our um, set of m functions. And I think the randomized rule is more common in practice. You'll see why in the next few slides. So we talked about this last time. We went through this little calculation that told us that, um, well, we know this already, kind of just from this, this comparison. Computationally, m stochastic steps are the same as one usual step, which we usually call a batch step in the context of stochastic methods. So we take m of these steps. It's computationally equivalent to one batch step, right? Because we're basically having to compute one subgrading per iteration versus m per iteration. So how about the progress? What about the progress you make over, say, m stochastic steps versus one batch step? And we did this simple calculation last time. And for this, um, just so that we can continue moving quickly, I won't go through it again, but go look back at the notes if you've forgotten, that showed that we can look at one, uh, one pass of m subgradient steps Right? We can look at a collection of m subgradient steps. And here we actually took them to be the cyclic rule. So one full cycle of stochastic subgradient steps as a noisy version of a single batch subgradient step. That's because at each iteration in the cyclic rule, um, we're picking one function to whose subgradient we're going to move along. If we accumulate that over one full cycle, we'll see it's the sum of m subgradients. And the only difference between that rule and the batch rule, and here we're actually looking at gradients just to make things simple, is that in the cyclic pass, we're actually evaluating the gradients kind of at the wrong spot. Instead of all evaluating them at the original point xk, we're evaluating them at, the, at a kind of more recent iterate. So if we were to believe that the gradient of f doesn't change drastically, under small perturbations of the input, like suppose the gradient was Lipschitz, which is one of our common assumptions that we make, then you might convince yourself that um, the stochastic method, which we can view as, like I said, a noisy batch gradient update over m cycles, makes about the same progress as one gradient update. And so it would converge possibly at the same rate. OK, that was a rough argument we gave last time. Just went through it quickly now. So the, the conclusion is that there's reason to believe that one cycle of stochastic subgradient updates is the same as one iteration of a batch update. And the same is true with um, the randomized rule as well. So the progress shouldn't be too much worse if we take m stochastic steps versus one batch step. That's good, because computationally it's the same. The progress, we said, shouldn't be much different. But what we gain with, with the stochastic steps is that we don't have to actually store, um, say, every one of those m functions in memory, which could be itself very costly. So that's one advantage, right? because we can just pull it out of memory as we need to evaluate its subgradient. Here's a little bit more, um, a little more precise results. Um, we're not going to prove these. The proofs of these. They're a little bit complicated because of the um, incremental nature of the stochastic method. But the reference I gave in the end for these has the proofs written down so you can see what they look like. They really look pretty similar to the one we did for subgradient method and the gradient method, but just taking into account the incremental nature, which is a little tricky. But the two results are as follows. Let's suppose, let's think about proving the subgradient results. So we're just going to assume the functions are convex. And just like we did with the single function that's convex, we're going to assume that it's Lipschitz. That's what we need to, to get a certain rate out of it. OK, and, and what we can say is that if you take a fixed step size, so you fix the step size to be some constant t across all iterations, then both the cyclic and randomized rules produce a sequence of iterates that converges to something that's suboptimal by an amount 5m squared g squared times t over 2. Let's just remind ourselves what the subgradient method bound looked like. So for the batch method, by the way, the, remember with a fixed step size, 
recall that we had um, something like this. Okay, so very similar bound for the the batch method versus the stochastic method. The five is not important. That's just an artifact of the proof, I think. The difference here is that we have an m squared. So here in the in the stochastic world, we have an m squared g squared rather than a g squared. Well, actually, that's also not really very different either, because remember, for the stochastic method. So each of these functions is G Lipschitz, which means that the function f, which is the sum of these guys, is M G Lipschitz. If you ask for the Lipschitz constant of the sum of G Lipschitz functions, you can easily work out that an upper bound for its Lipschitz constant is M G. So actually, in that sense, the stochastic bound looks very similar. Again, ignore the 5. We just have an mg squared, because that's the Lipschitz constant in this world of the full function. Okay, So they really are comparable bounds. For uh, diminishing step sizes, we have the same result that we had for, again, a single function, doing uh, you know, stochastic gradient descent on, on one function the usual setting, which is that we get something that's um, optimal on the limit if we take diminishing step sizes. OK, so, so far all we've told ourselves is that you don't do too much worse in terms of progress with the stochastic methods than you do with the batch method. Oh, um, maybe I have my, maybe my memory's wrong. I think it's actually t. We can check just by going back real quick. Let's just check. Yeah, it looks like it was t. So the slides are right. I just wrote it down wrong. OK, now here's the interesting part. We're going to talk about convergence rates, because that's really, remember, where we see all the action is. I think that, that algorithms converge in the kind of uh, in the limit of, as of infinitely many steps is maybe somewhat interesting, but we actually care about how fast we get the solution in practice. And this is a lot more um, kind of subtle to derive than just these bounds. And so again, I'll refer you to this paper at the end of, I mean, to this, uh, it's kind of like a, it's a monograph that I'm I'm referencing at the end of these notes if you want to see the proofs for them. But um, the punchline is that um, is as follows. So let's talk about rates. Remember the, sto the batch rate was 1 over epsilon squared. And if we paid close attention to the, um, to the constants there, you can see it was something that depended on how far we were away from the solution set to begin with, which I'm going to ignore for now, times the Lipschitz constant of the full function, which I'll call g batch squared over epsilon squared. Okay, And so I guess just to be clear, I'll write this as g batch again. OK, how do we do with um, the cyclic rule? Let's look at that one first. So what's the cyclic rate? Well, the cyclic rate ends up being, I'm going to write it a little differently than what's on the slides, m times mg squared over epsilon squared. This is the iteration complexity. It's how many iterations we need in order to get uh, an error on the order of epsilon. You can see this is actually pretty much the exact same as what we get with the batch method. Because right? remember we said that m, m iterations 
of the cyclic rule are computationally the same as one um, iteration of the, of the batch rule. So if we ask for the cycle complexity, how many cycles do we need? It's just going to be mg squared over epsilon. Remember, this was the, like the Lipschitz constant of our sum of functions, and we have m of them. So really, it's the same. We don't, we don't gain much with the cyclic rule over the batch rule. What we do gain, like we said, is that we don't have to keep all the data in memory, so that's nice. But here's the very important point about the randomized rule, which is why people use it in practice, and that's the following, which is that the iteration complexity essentially shaves off a factor of m. That's what we get. Okay, so in other words, if we're asking for the cycle complexity, right, how many cycles of the randomized rule do we need? Which is, remember, one cycle is, is a computationally the same amount of work as one batch iteration. So to get an error of epsilon, we can see that it's actually mg squared over epsilon squared. So this is reduced by a factor of M. That's the, the big gain we get with the randomized rule. Now, with the randomized rule, this is a bound in expectation. Okay, so this means, on average, the number of um, cycles we need is m g squared over epsilon squared. For the cyclic rule, it's a worst case bound. Okay, so an interesting question might be, is this a difference between what we can prove on average and in the worst case, or is there actually some practical difference? And the practitioners of stochastic gradient descent, I'd say almost always take randomized, uh, the randomized choices of functions. I don't know very many applications which at scale actually cycle through the functions in a cyclic fashion, but you know, I, there's not a definitive answer as far as I can tell. Okay, but at least in this sense, it seems preferable to use the randomized rule, right? We know on average we're going to be saving a factor of m versus a full batch update. Any questions about that? Yeah? So in practice, do you like to use um, not the full batch? That's full batch uh, so the next slide, I'll tell you the rule of thumb. But in practice, people use the randomized rule because it because of the memory um, limitations of the batch rule. So that's, uh, if you don't have a problem with memory. that's that's a huge concern. I mean, I think again, this is a very kind of crude statement, but memory starts becoming a problem in many cases faster than computational cycles do. As I really understand. I really respect that. Okay. I realize that's what it was. If you don't have any Um, that's hard to answer. So this is the, the, let me give you an example and you can see the punchline. The answer is kind of. It depends on how accurate you want the final solution to be. So this is an example I, I'm trying to give to portray the difference in behaviors of stochastic versus batch methods. Um, it's a lo logistic regression setting. So each one of these functions, remember this is logistic regression loss. If I have binary yi and predictors xi, trying to classify according to those predictors, then I can write the logistic regression loss as a sum of functions. Each of these are, are convex and smooth, so I can think about applying stochastic gradient descent here. Okay, and my example is not with n equals 500 million. My example is with a much smaller n, but I'm saying think about if somebody asks to do this when n is that large. Right? It would be very hard in R or MATLAB, Python, whatever, if you're not using a distributed setting, to, to minimize this loss function um, if you didn't have a stochastic alternative. One batch update, just to keep in mind the computational cost here, it costs n times p, where n is the number of um, observations, p is the number of predictors. That's because that's the cost of computing the gradient and taking the inner product of the, uh, that's the cost of computing the gradient. And one stochastic update costs O of p, order of p, right? So. If, uh, if n was huge and p was comparable, this p was comparably larger, even smaller. This is a very, very big difference between the two. 
So clearly, if I gave you a budget of 10,000 stochastic steps, it would be a lot more affordable than you know, the same number of batch steps. Um, right. OK, so let me show you the, the classic picture between the two, um, which is something you'll see a lot. Uh, I, I did this in two dimensions just so that you could see, you could visualize the contours. So I solved the logistic regression problem, where n was quite large, p was 2, just so I could visualize the contours. And I took um, you know, the usual batch gradient descent steps and stochastic gradient descent steps, and I plotted their convergence um, towards the, the solution, which is this star here. They both start at the same place. Remember, each one of these batch steps is order np computations. Each one of these stochastic steps is order p. So if I take 20 steps to get to this kind of second to inner contour, with the red versus the blue points, that's actually quite a big difference in terms of their computational cost. And this was the, I used a randomized uh, rule here, not the cyclic rule. And the general rule of thumb, which is made precise in some theory, um, and again, see that, that monograph that I made, that, that I referenced at the end of the notes, is that stochastic methods generally strive when you're far away from optimum. So they make a lot of progress out here. In fact, their progress is a lot quicker than batch rules. Whereas um, the, uh, the batch methods generally uh, have an advantage when you're close to the solution. So stochastic methods kind of bounce around without the same kind of precision when you're close to the solution, whereas the batch methods can, uh, we have kind of more precise understanding of their convergence when you're close to optimality. That's kind of the general rule of thumb. So if you're in a situation where you, all you cared about was an approximate solution, suppose I, I, you know, I was solving some statistics problem or statistics and machine learning problem where the noise in my observations was large enough that I thought, actually, I don't need the exact solution. I need something close to it. Then you probably want to use, use a stochastic method because if you're anywhere in here, you're probably going to be experiencing, say, comparable classification error, right? Moving from the second to last contour to the, optim to the optimum solution is probably not a big difference in terms of the, the test error. And other applications, say in those in statistics and machine learning, you really want a very precise solution. You're not going to get it with, with a stochastic method. So it really depends what you're looking for. Was there a question here somewhere? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that the difference between the rates is because one is an average case and the other is a worst case. So the cyclic, uh, cyclic rule is a worst case bound. The randomized rule is an average case bound. A lot of times we can prove average case bounds that are a lot stronger than the worst case. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure how you would phrase it. To, to, I'm not sure how you would phrase an average case result for the cyclic case. It'd be interesting to know that if you could phrase one, does it come out kind of of comparable order to the expected number of iterations in the randomized rule. But, um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really know if that's an artifact, like I said, of the difference in the, the proof, how you prove a randomized rule versus a worst case bound, or whether there's actually a big difference. Did you have a? Right, that's a good point. Yeah, so th those are, there's a very big difference between what I'm talking about when I'm talking about an, a worst case bound, or sorry, an average case bound, like over statistical noise, over decisions by the algorithm. So th this, this says that if you give me any function that's Lipschitz, then um, averaged over the random choices by the algorithm, I get this number of iterations needed before 1 over epsilon, from, before I'm over, be, uh, be less than epsilon away from optimality. Here, like Javier suggested, we might put down a, maybe a statistical model for the problem, and then you could, you could do an analysis of this in that average sense, but I'm not sure if there's a way to talk about an average behavior for one problem instance with a cyclic rule. But I think it's an interesting question. Did you have another point? Um, yes, I think that that's, that's the same, right? Yeah. Sure. 
on the slide supposed to be squared? Notes. Yeah, I just had a typo here. These are all supposed to be squares. Thanks. All right, like I said, we're going to try to come back to this at the end. turns out there's been some very um, recent and interesting work by people in ML um, that's kind of pushing the frontier of stochastic methods. This stuff is all quite classic still, this analysis of stochastic methods. So, well, actually, I can continue with the last couple points of motivation here before we switch over to proximal gradient descent. So this is what we saw last time, um, and we saw this with the stochastic methods as well, which was that the subgradient method is very broadly applicable. We can pretty much minimize any function whose subgradients we can compute. The downside is that its convergence rate is very slow. So 1 over epsilon squared is a big difference, is a big kind of distance, in a sense, from 1 over epsilon when we talk about rates. Um, 1 over epsilon being the rate we get when we have smooth functions that are convex, if we use gradient descent. And so the number of iterations required to get an accurate solution with the subgradient method is actually really large. And so that's its downside. And so we ask, can we do better? And we, we asked this question, I think, with the um, gradient descent, at least that was in the slides. I wasn't here for this lecture, but I'm pretty sure you guys covered that. Which is, we might pose a question like, if we were to look at a broader class of methods than the subgradient method, which I'll call non-smooth first-order methods, and these are methods that start with some initial point, and at any point, at any iteration k, they can update uh, xk to lie in essentially the span of all subgradients seen so far. Um, and you can convince yourself that the subgradient method is actually one, it lies in this class just by, you can do a simple inductive proof, right? XK, mi XK it lies in XK minus 1 plus something that's aligned with uh, GK minus 1. And that's going to, and XK minus 1 is going to lie in, in XK minus 2 plus something that's aligned with GK minus 2, et cetera. And if you just kind of complete that inductive argument, you'll see that actually it lies in, um, X, the first point we start off, plus the span of all subgradients seen so far. And the setup we're going to look at now is, is one in which these subgradients come from a weak oracle, which means that we don't get to choose which subgradient we see. We just are given a subgradient. So imagine there's a black box that we have where we ask, I have this function f. I'm at the point, say, xk. Please tell me a subgradient. If there's many subgradients, we don't get control over which one we see. We just get one back. Because in practice, that's really, we don't always have kind of strong control over the subdifferential. We usually just know how to compute subgradients. So let's suppose that we are looking at a method of this type. And then there's a very nice theorem by Nesteroff. The, the other lower bound for gradient descent was also from Nesteroff. And these aren't very hard to prove, by the way. Um, in fact, last year we had one of these as a homework question. We may, I don't think we'll revisit them, but you can check out the solutions from last year's class if you're interested. The, the statement is as follows. If you give me any k, any iteration k, any starting point, then I can find a function that's convex in Lipschitz such that any non-smooth first order method satisfies the following bound, which is that after k iterations, the amount that it is away from optimality is um, some constant, r times g, g being the Lipschitz constant of the function, r being, again, the, the distance away you are from the solution set with x0, divided by something that's on the order of root k. Okay, these particular constants here are not important. This is on the order of root k. What that means, right, is that a lower bound is order 1 over epsilon squared for any non-smooth first order method. Or in other words, we can't do better than subgradient method. In terms of worst case rates, that's the, it achieves the best. It's up there with the best of them. So that may be seeming, seeming to be a little bit depressing because we know it's slow, right? Question? Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you can think of n as the dimension of the problem, it can be pretty large, right? I think n can be very large, typically. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not sure, I mean, this proof is, is fairly slick. I'm not sure if, if um, taking k to be larger than n really matters. 
we, can, we might think about that uh, looking at the proof. I'm not sure. That, that restriction, I think, was to make the proof simple. The proof's not very complicated. Okay, so in a sense, this might be a bit depressing, because it says we can't do better than this rate with, sub, with, with any other method. So the subgradient method, despite the fact that it's pretty slow, you know, it's about the best we can do if all we assume is that our functions are convex and Lipschitz. So instead of trying to improve across the board, right, instead of trying to figure out a better method for any convex function that's not smooth, which we know we can't really do in terms of rates, we're going to focus on minimizing uh, functions that are of our kind of a more particular form. And that's, those are composite functions. Those are functions that look like um, g plus h, where g is a smooth function, and h is a non-smooth function, but it's simple in some sense. So we're going to try to focus our attention on functions that kind of in total are non-smooth, right? Because if, if h is non-smooth, then g plus h is non-smooth um, sometimes, or most of the time. Um, but the, the non-smooth part is, in a sense, simple. And we'll see this actually captures a lot of problems that we encounter in statistics and machine learning. We don't need to kind of generically just consider convex functions. We can focus on this class instead. And what we're going to see in this lecture is that um, for a lot of problems, in other words, a lot of these non-smooth parts h that are kind of simple, we can recover the 1 over epsilon rate of, of gradient descent. Okay, and that's called proximal gradient descent, that algorithm. So let's just get right to that. So we're going to talk about proximal gradient descent. We're going to um, talk about some convergence bounds for it. We're going to see two examples, one um, involving a sparse regression setting, the other involving matrix completion, both of which we can solve with, um, with proximal gradient. And then we'll talk about a few special cases. And lastly, we'll talk about acceleration, which is a very interesting idea that uh, even better is the rate of proximal gradient descent. So we can get an even better rate than that. I don't think we're going to be able to finish all this material today, considering we already are you know, halfway into, uh, so half an hour into the lecture. But that's OK, because uh, Wednesday's lecture, I think, is going to be pretty short. So if we spill into Wednesday's lecture, then the material I was intending to cover on Wednesday, we can do that no problem. So we'll make, we'll make up for our tardiness on Wednesday. So here's the problem setting we're going to look at from now on for the rest of this lecture. f of x is written, can be written as g of x plus h of x, where g is convex, it's differentiable. h is convex and not necessarily differentiable. And we're going to assume that h is simple in some sense that I'll make precise in the next slide. So if, if f were differentiable, then the gradient update right, would just be to take the gradient of f and to move along the negative gradient of f by some step size t. Remember, to motivate that, one of the ways we motivated that was is that this was doing something like minimizing a quadratic approximation around f at each point. So if we had you know, some convex function, then at each point, we're going to form a quadratic approximation. right? And so that was not the right picture. You might choose to make a quadratic approximation, right? That looks something like this at the point x. And then we minimize it, and it brings us to, say, this point, which is x plus, the next point in our gradient update. And this quadratic approximation, remember, was just to take um, f around x and um, add the first order term, which looks like the gradient of f transpose z minus x. And then for the quadratic part, we, we just were designed to add a spherical quadratic. So then the distance between z minus x squared dividing by 2t. So we call this quadratic approximation to f, f tilde of z. Right, that's this guy. this guy. This guy is f. This guy is f tilde. And to get the gradient update, we could think about just min repeatedly forming these quadratic approximations, minimizing them, and that's actually what this is doing. You can just take the, take the gradient here with respect to z, set it equal to 0. You'll see that actually this is the update that you, that you find. So how do we do that for this composite function, g plus h? Well, here's the following 
here's a suggestion. It's fairly simple. Because G is differentiable, but H is not, let's just make a quadratic approximation to G and leave H alone. Let's just try that. So it's hard to draw on a picture because I'm actually observing this smooth thing plus something else. I'm only going to make the quadratic approximation to the smooth part. So in other words, we're going to minimize G tilde of Z plus H of Z. Right? I didn't touch this part at all. This is just the same as the original function H. But G tilde was the quadratic approximation to G, which I can write out just as I did with F. It's G of X plus the gradient of g of x transpose z minus x plus 1 over 2t, the norm of z minus x squared. And I still have the non-smooth part hanging around, h of z. What you can see is that this, um, this rule here, minimizing this um, quadratic function plus h, can be rewritten in a kind of uh, suggestive form. It's, it's more natural if you write it like this. It's the same as minimizing the distance between z and the gradient update if we had just used g squared divided by 2t plus h. And how do we see that part? It's somewhat simple. Let's just um, expand that. Expand this out. Right, we get something involving um, Right, we get 1 over 2t times, write it like this, z minus x um, plus take one more step, and now it's expanded out. So we get a term that looks like this, 1 over 2t times z minus x squared. Um, this part only depends on x. If we, if we look at this part squared. And remember, the minimum's over z, so that doesn't really matter. I'm going to forget about that part. And what does the cross term look like? It looks like um, minus 1 over t, because I did minus 2 times 1 over 2t, times z minus x um, transpose t times the gradient of g of x. And that t is going to cancel out with this one. Oh, there's no minus, sorry. It's just plus, because right, that's a plus. And you'll see that's the second part we have on this uh, line above. And again, the terms that depend on x don't matter. We can add or subtract whatever we want. So that explains the presence of g of x here, plus terms that depend on x. OK, so we can rewrite it in this form. And now let's interpret this. This, this part says that. At every step, we want to take um, a direction that minimizes this criterion. It's composed of two parts. The first part tells us to stay close to the gradient update for g. So had we just tried to make the gradient, uh, gradient descent on g alone, this is what we would have gotten. Uh, we would have tried to, we would have taken this step, x minus t times the gradient of g of x. We're trying to make z close to that. And we're also trying to make h small. So we're trying to balance those two things. Now I'm going to do something that may look suspicious, which is I'm going to def just define the proximal mapping to be some function that's defined in terms of h. Okay, so really the prox is actually a function of t and h. I'm just not, it depends on both t and h. I'm just not denoting it. Uh, I'm not having a notational dependence on h in the slides. But I'm just going to write it down here so that you can stare at it after the slide's passed, which is defined as follows. You pass the prox in argument x, it returns to you the point z that minimizes this criterion. L2 norm of x minus z squared divided by 2t plus h of z. It's called the proximal mapping. And with that definition, we're going to find something called proximal gradient descent, which is just at every iteration, we're going to take the proximal mapping of the gradient step with respect to g. And you can see that um, right? what we'd seen from up here was we took x plus, which was equal to 
1 over 2t. It's the argument of this. Another way to write that, this is our rule that we'd said, is just to say this is equal to the prox, prox function evaluated what argument? It's just this argument. So that's proximal gradient descent. So really nothing different happened from this in the last slide. I'm just uh, introducing this prox function notationally came from the idea of just, like we said, taking a quadratic approximation to G only and leaving H alone. So just stare at that for a second, because that's an important equation we're going to carry on the rest of the lecture with. OK, to make that look more familiar, you might want to rewrite that as xk minus tk times something that looks like a gradient, right? That was what we had. That's how we had gradient descent and subgradient descent, we have them both in this form. So you might want to write proximal gradient descent, descent to fit this form. Um, this is really just for convenience of proof in some sense, or convenience um, of form later on. There's no, there's really nothing, there's no reason why this form is better than this form. Um, and we can just define g to make this work, right? If I told you I wanted the updates to look like this, you could just solve for g to make that um, make that happen, and you'll see that G just ends up looking like this. Not really very important. I think it's better to, to, to remember this um, form of proximal gradient. So I said this was suspicious, and it's because I really kind of swapped out one minimization for another, right? I said we want to minimize uh, G plus H. I'll define this prox function, and then, hey, I have an algorithm for it. It just takes um, prox of the gradient updates with respect to G over and over again. But if this is a hard minimization problem, then that wasn't really very fair, right? Because this, is, this notation is hiding the fact that this is itself requ requiring me to find the minimizer of some criterion it's defined in terms of h. The reason why proximal gradient is a useful um, framework is because often, for a lot of functions h that are simple, even if they're non-smooth, this proximal update can be done analytically. So it's not really requiring a minimization of its own. It's actually something we can just write down on paper, and it's usually pretty cheap as well. There are exceptions, but in a lot of cases, for H's that we're interested in, we can do this proximal minimization analytically. OK, so there's some um, important things to know, which is that this prox function doesn't depend on G at all. It only depends on H. So let's just do a thought experiment. Suppose H was some simple function whose prox we knew. G was a very, very complicated function, but it was smooth. Then that doesn't really change the complexity uh, of this algorithm as long as we can compute the gradients of G. If we can compute the gradients of G, then minimizing G plus H is not much harder than minimizing some other G plus H as long as we can compute its gradients. Because this prox is defined entirely in terms of H. The other thing to keep in mind is that the convergence analysis that we cite um, is going to be in terms of the number of iterations of the algorithm. So it's the number of times we have to apply this update, or this update, right? But uh, this is not always a fair comparison to a gradient update, because the prox, I said even though we can compute it analytically in many cases, the prox could still be expensive, or more expensive than just um, you know, computing a gradient. So keep that in mind that we're talking about the number of proximal iterations needed to conversion, convergence, not the number of operations, not the number of flops. So we're, we're talking about something a little different. Yeah? That's a, a great um, example, yeah. So I, I'm, we're going to get to kind of two examples later on that are both in that framework. But for now, you can often think of G as a loss function. Maybe it comes from a log likelihood, and H as a regularizer or a penalty. Okay, so the loss, depending on uh, you know what data type we have, it can be complicated. 
the regularizer of the penalty, we usually throw around a couple of them that we use quite often, like the L1 norm. We're going to see the trace norm coming into play with matrix completion. You know, there are several others that are in a bag of tricks that we can use proximal gradient for. Those are two good ones to think of. Yeah? Good question. Um, yes. I mean, at least so far as the proof goes, it is. And I don't know, I honestly don't know of examples where people don't take them to be the same. So the question was, is it important that, um, right, say this t and this t be the same? And uh, so far as the proof goes, yes. I don't know, like I said, maybe it would work otherwise. Yeah, that's a good point. So Yusheng was saying, if we went back to this motivation, right, um, then there's really just one t, and that's determining the curvature of the quadratic part. And when we write in this form, it looks like there's kind of, it appears in two places. It's a good point. OK, let's get to an example, um, and then we'll take a break. And this example uh, is how to do proximal gradient ascent to solve the lasso problem. I can't remember if we did this. No, we did, we did something like this with subgradients, too, and you saw it converge quite slowly. Um, and ISTA is the name of the algorithm that comes out. It stands for Iterative Soft Thresholding Algorithm, and you'll see why it's called that in just a second. So this is our function f. We're going to think of it as g plus h, where g is the smooth least squares loss h is lambda times the L1 penalty. So we've seen this formulation, I think, at least twice now. Uh, the lasso is a way of doing sparse linear regression, right? estimating coefficients beta for the regression of y and x that are sparse, that have zero entries. And they're selectively sparse. So we, the program, the lasso program, um, selects out elements of beta that you know, it thinks are uninformative in the prediction of y from x. So what's the proximal mapping? Remember, it has nothing to do with g. I could have put this as logistic regression loss. I could have put this as um, multinomial. I could have put this, you know, something much more complicated, as long as it's smooth and convex. Doesn't matter. The prox is only defined in terms of h. And the proximal mapping is the minimizer of um, the following criterion. 1 over 2t times the norm of beta minus z squared plus lambda times the L1 norm of z. And let's just rewrite that in a trivial way. It's the argmin over all z of 1 half z minus beta squared plus lambda t L1 norm of z. So I just put the t up there instead of having it down there. The minimizer is the same. This was uh, soft thresholding. We proved this when we talked about subgradients. The minimizer of this program, the solution, is just giving by soft thresholding uh, beta by the amount lambda t. Remember, it's just written here on the slide. So we've already done that one. So the proximal operator we actually know for this. And again, no matter what um, g was, it's going to be essentially the same thing. We're going to apply the same proximal operator, just soft thresholding. So I'm just doing it for the least squares loss case so you can see what it looks like concretely. For the least squares loss case, remember I told you that you guys are going to have this ingrained in your head, certainly by the midterm. The, the gradient is going to just be minus x transpose y minus x beta. And so proximal gradient, it takes the prox operator applied to the, gra the gradient updates with respect to g. It looks like beta minus t times the gradient of g. The gradient of g is minus x transpose y minus x beta. So this, the inside um, amount looks like beta plus t times x transpose y minus x beta. And we soft threshold that. OK, so let's interpret this. This says um, you're at beta. You're trying to do le uh, sparse least squares. Move in the direction of the correlation with, of the variables with the residual. Right? If some variable has high correlation or high inner product with the residual, you want to increase that variable along that direction. After you're done, you're going to 
uh, soft threshold that. So if things are, if any element of beta is smaller than lambda t, set it equal to zero. Otherwise, just move it to zero by an amount lambda t. So it actually is a pretty natural algorithm for doing, um, for fitting a sparse regression model. And because of this, the nature of these updates, it's called the iterative soft thresholding algorithm. That was named by uh, Beck and Taboul um, in a paper they had on this topic. So it's very simple, and it's also a pretty effective algorithm for computing a lasso solution. And I'm sure I'm boring you by saying this over and over again, but I'm just going to keep saying it because it's important. It doesn't matter that we chose least squares here. Right? The, the algorithm will be just as simple as long as you can compute the gradient of your loss function. You just stick in grade, minus gradient of g here instead of this, this term. So here's a comparison between um, proximal gradient for this least squares loss problem and the subgradient method applied to it. And they have a very different, um, very different convergence behaviors. And what's suggestive is that maybe there's a whole other regime of convergence here, right? We know this is 1 over epsilon squared. This may look like something like 1 over epsilon. And that's what we're going to see um, theoretically, I think, next. Yeah. So before we do the convergence analysis, let's just take a quick couple minute break. I guess I took it out. I had it in the slides, then I got rid of it. Maybe because I thought I was going to put on the homework, and then I forgot to put on the homework. So lucky you guys don't have to prove this. Um, the proof is really very similar to what we do in gradient descent. So if you want to look back at the gradient descent proof, um, essentially, we're going to, to prove it, we just replace the gradient by this generalized gradient everywhere. That's why we wrote it like this. And then we really fall essentially the exact same steps that we do for gradient descent. But there's some, some modification we need to make for the fact that we actually have, this g is not really a gradient, right? It, it behaves kind of like gradient, but it's not actually a gradient of something. So I'll just tell you the answer. Um, and I might put the proof back in the slides after this lecture, um, just so you can get an outline of it. And that is, uh, the, the result that we're looking at right now is that if g is convex differentiable, and we make the standard assumption we make about it when we talk about kind of the smooth analysis of a first order method, which is that its gradient is Lipschitz. And h is convex, and we're going to assume that its procs can be evaluated. That's all we're going to say, right? That this is possible to do. Um, then the proximal gradient descent with a fixed step size that's smaller than or equal to one of the Lipschitz constant of the smooth part, has the exact same convergence rate as gradient descent. And in fact, it's the same constants we saw with gradient descent as well. Okay, So it's really a very analogous convergence result. So it converges at the rate 1 over k, because after k steps, the progress that we've made, distance away from optimality in terms of the criterion function, is like 1 over k. In other words, to get an epsilon accurate solution, we need 1 over epsilon iterations on the order of that. So this is the same as gradient descent, but it's important to remember this counts the number of iterations. right? Each iteration evaluates this prox function, and it's not the number of operations. So it could be much more expensive than gradient descent, depending on what the prox function actually is. Let's go back to this example. How expensive was this prox operator? If beta is n-dimensional, and how many operations does it take to compute this prox operator? Think about what I'm doing. Just, I don't need, I don't, I'm looking for constants, just on the order of what function of n? Order of n, right, that's all it is, because we're just going through each component, and we're saying, is it bigger than lambda, between minus lambda and lambda, or smaller than minus lambda? And it, we're just doing something very simple in each of these cases, like subtracting something or setting it equal to 0. And there's n of those that we're doing. So it's order of n. That's it. So that's not expensive, right? In fact, a gradient computation in this case is order of n also, um, or order of np. So the prox is not expensive compared to the gradient. But in other examples, we'll see um, that the proxy is much more expensive. 
OK. So um, just like we did with gradient ascent, we can also use backtracking. It's not a nice thing about proximal gradient. With, with uh, subgradient ascent, we are st stuck with these fixed step size rules, which don't really adapt to the problem at hand. We can reintroduce the notion of backtracking here with gradient descent. Um, it's the same notion of backtracking we have with gradient descent, except for using g in place of f, so the smooth part in place of the whole function, and the generalized gradient in place of the gradient. There are actually multiple ways to do backtracking for proximal gradient. This one, I think, is the simplest. OK, so just think of, um, let's, let's reduce our, in our mind to the case where um, g was f. So suppose all we had was a smooth part. In that case, the generalized gradient is just the gradient of f. What does this look like? I have minus the gradient of f transpose the gradient of f plus t over 2 times the gradient of f in norm squared. It ends up just looking like the gradient uh, descent backtracking rule, right? Because this part is just going to be minus t over 2 times the norm of the gradient of f squared. So this is just a generalization of that where we replace, like I said, the gradient with the generalized gradient. And the function whose um, derivative we know, whose gradient we know, with just g, because we don't have a gradient for h. So same idea. On the same assumptions as the last slide, so you know, gradient of g Lipschitz, h is prox can be evaluated, we get the same rate. And again, the proof is analogous to the proof for um, gradient descent. So we have this nice set of tools for proximal gradient. We can apply backtracking line search, tends to work well in practice, and we know it has a pretty good convergence rate, certainly with respect to when compared to uh, the subgradient methods convergence rate. So things are looking pretty good. Here's an example, another example of um, proximal gradient applied. And we're going to see this is one in which the prox operator is actually pretty complicated, or it's pretty expensive, but it's still a very useful algorithm for this problem. Before I do that, let me pause and see if the people have questions, because we kind of went through some of this stuff fairly quickly. I don't see a reason why we can't do the semantic idea here as well. And instead of doing the both the full gradient plus the gradient over one step. You're absolutely right, yeah. So stochastic proximal methods are certainly something people do. Um, Maybe we'll talk about them at the end when we talk about the stochastic advanced topics. If you look at the monograph referenced, all of the rates I talked about for the stochastic stuff actually extend to the setting, too. So this is a good point. You're saying can't we? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of, no. Right, so backtracking um, it halts when you're uh, when you're something that's uh, when you're a certain fraction away from what you get if you just did a linear extrapolation of the function. Right? You can't possibly hope to get the same progress as if you got a, if the function was actually linear. So you kind of relax that and ask to ask for some fraction of that progress. That's where the backtracking criterion comes from. Um, that linearization depends on the gradient, right? So if, if, you don't, if you're not differentiable, then there are many such linear functions. So it's, it's hard to know what you would do in that case. Good questions, though. OK, let's talk about matrix completion, another interesting framework people are working in. Um, gained a lot of popularity in the recent years. So let's suppose that we have a matrix that's m by n, and we only observe certain entries of that matrix. And the observable set we're going to call omega. So it's only entries i, j that are in the set omega do we observe of y. Otherwise, we don't actually observe y. We want to fill in missing entries. That's the goal in some sensible way. And so this is often done in recommender systems. Um, right? The, the, one of the big surges in popularity of this uh, problem framework came from the Netflix prize, where you can think of y as being a matrix, say, whose rows correspond to users and whose columns correspond to movies. And the ith jth entry is the rating that the ith user would have given to the jth movie. Well, because not every user sees every movie, we don't actually observe all entries of this matrix. Right? That would be pretty ridiculous. 
Um, but we, if, by filling in the missing entries, we're kind of estimating some kind of uh, rating that each user would give to each movie had that user watched that movie. And this might be helpful for recommending uh, movies to, to users that they haven't seen before. So how do we do that? Well, one way to do that is to solve what we call the matrix completion problem, which is that we're going to fit a new matrix B, and we're going to fit every entry of B, so it's going to be fully observed, that minimizes the following criterion. Over the observed set, omega, we want it to be as close to Y as possible, so we apply square, a squared error loss over those entries. And we're going to add lambda, which lambda is a penalty parameter, just like it's a penalty parameter or tuning parameter, say, in lasso, plus the trace norm of B. Okay, so this is an interesting problem. The trace norm, if you remember, is the sum of the singular values of a matrix. So if the matrix is of rank R, then it's the sum of sigma 1 through sigma R. It has R non-zero singular values. This is really, in a sense, the generalization of the L1 norm to the matrix world. That's how you can think about it. Um, if the matrix were diagonal, for example, then this would exactly be the sum of the absolute values of the entries of the, matrix, of the diagonal entries. The, the trace norm is motivated as a convex relaxation of the rank. So because this problem is underdetermined, we can't just ask to solve to find the B that minimizes this uh, squared error loss to Y in the observed set, because then we would take B to be exactly equal to Y IJ for all the observed IJ, and then we have no kind of, there's no forcing function on the rest of um, the Bs to, to have us do anything sensible. Right? The solution is not even well defined outside of the observable set. This is kind of saying something like, I want the matrix that's closest to Y of, over the observed entries, but that's as low rank as possible. Now, that's, it's a reasonable thing to do in this problem for various reasons, but I think we probably won't go too much more into it because we're focused now on how to solve it. And um, the trace norm is, is like a convex relaxation of the rank. Right? The rank is the sum of the uh, of indicators that each singular value is non-zero. Right? That's, that's the rank. How many non-zero singular values do you have? This is actually summing the values of the singular values themselves. So um, let's rewrite this problem in a way that we can, uh, we, we can use for proximal gradient. So first we're going to define a projection operator onto the observed set. And it's just notation. If, we, um, if you give me a matrix B that has you know, all its entries filled in, I'll write P omega of B to be a new matrix um, whose entries are, are not changed on the observed set. They're just Bij. And outside the observed set, I set them all equal to 0. Okay. Then I can rewrite the criterion as um, the difference between p omega of y and p omega of b, right? Because this is just this is just yij minus bij over the observed set, and it's zero everywhere else. In Frobenius norm squared, the Frobenius norm of a matrix is the sum of the squares of its entries. So that first term is really just the exact same as this one. And again, we have lambda times the trace norm of b. So that's going to be our smooth part. And that's going to be our non-smooth part. And there's two ingredients needed to, do, to you know, form a proximal gradient descent approach. That is, how do we compute the gradient of the smooth part? And how do we evaluate the prox operator? If we know those two things, we have our, ourselves a proximal gradient algorithm. The gradient of the smooth part is very, sm is very straightforward. Um, think about it entry-wise, that this is confusing you. For every observed entry ij, the gradient is just going to be equal to bij minus yij of this loss. It's the only appearance of, of bij in all of the, um, the, the ith j component of the gradient is just bij minus yij. That's the only appearance of bij in the whole loss. That's all that this is. And it's zero outside of that. So this is really just the gradient of that loss function. The prox function uh, is now trickier. We have to find the matrix B, sorry, the matrix Z. If you give me a certain matrix B, find the matrix Z that's closest to B in a squared error after I add lambda times the trace norm of Z. Okay. And again, I think there may be a little bit of confusion that people have when we go from the vector world to the matrix world. All of this is, the, is really the same thing we were saying before, except we've shaped our arguments into matrices. There's nothing special here. Right, this Frobenius norm just means sum of squared components 
just because I've shaped things into matrices. That's it. So we have to figure out how to compute this prox function. Once we do that, we're just going to apply it to this over and over again, this part. And that will give us our algorithm. So part of this you're going to do in your homework, part of it we're going to do here. And we're going to see that um, the proximal operator here is what I'm calling matrix soft thresholding. So it's the analogy of soft thresholding, but for matrices. In other words, um, if you give me a matrix B, and I compute its singular value decomposition, so this is the singular value decomposition of B, then um, the prox operator at, a, at some level, call it lambda, applied to B is U times um, a diagonal matrix where we soft threshold the singular values. So remember, in the singular value composition, right, this is orthogonal. That's diagonal with positive entries. These are the singular values, and that's orthogonal. And so the, the proximal operator is going to just be given by subtracting off lambda from each of the diagonal entries, making sure that we don't um, making sure that we don't go through zero. So just soft thresholding the singular values of sigma and then forming the, the left and right singular factors as we did before. So we're going to kind of half prove this is true um, on these slides and the other half you're, you're proving on your homework. So why is this true? This is good practice with deriving a prox operator. We derive the, the other prox operator in the vector case for the L1 norm, the prox operator of the L1 norm being soft thresholding in a previous lecture. So let's write down this minimization problem. Um, minimize over all z, 1 half or 1 over 2t. Um, I guess I used. b minus c and for b minus norm squared plus lambda times the trace norm of z. And I'm going to put the t up here like I did before. Lambda t. So what does it mean for z to be optimal with respect to this criterion? Well, we know that. We can take a subgradient, set it equal to 0. And if we can solve that, we have the, um, the solution. That's just subgrading optimality. We've learned that a couple times before. So let's take a subgrading of this criterion. We're going to say that um, right, the subgrading of this part is just going to be equal to uh, z minus b, because that part's smooth. So this is just the gradient of that. Again, this is just like it is for vectors. Should be no real confusion here. This is just like z minus b squared. This part, um, we'll call it uh, lambda t times gamma. So 0, we're going to set equal to z minus b plus lambda t times gamma, where gamma is something that's in the subdifferential of the trace norm at z. Okay, so That's just subgrading optimality. And this is what you're going to do in your homework. On your homework, you're going to actually compute subgradients of the trace norm. So you're going to fill in that part on the slide. But I'm just going to claim that um, it's written up there, but I'll just rewrite it on the, on the piece of paper here. The subgradients of the trace norm, if, um, if z has a singular value decomposition, you know, z equals u sigma b transpose. And the subgradients of the trace norm are anything that looks like u b transpose plus w, where um, w has operator norm at most 1. And it's orthogonal to both the left and right singular factors. 
this comes from your homework. You know, homework steps you through that. Okay, so now we can take any one of these as a subgrading up here, right? So we're going to try to take one of these subgradients, plug it in, and we're going to try to plug in um, for z, actually plug in z equals u sigma lambda t v transpose and show that we can actually satisfy the subgrading optimality with this choice. If we can do that, then this is the solution. OK. Um, can anybody see what's going to happen? So let's go ahead and plug that in. We're going to get um, z minus b, right, is going to be, remember, b was equal to u sigma v transpose. So z minus b is just equal to u times sigma lambda t minus sigma times uh, v transpose plus lambda times t times gamma. We want to make that equal to 0 for some valid subgradient gamma. So how are we going to define gamma in this case? We want to set this equal to 0, right? Well, there's only really one thing we can do, which is that we can, we can uh, solve for what gamma should be, right? Gamma is equal to, it's going to be 1 over lambda times t, u sigma minus sigma lambda t v transpose. I've just put the minus in front. I've sucked it in to change the signs of that and hope that this is a subgradient, as a valid subgradient. If that's a valid subgradient, then we're OK. Otherwise, we're in trouble, because the solution I've claimed is not correct. So all right, um, we have to write this right as uh, uv transpose plus something that, that is of this form, w. So uh, let's write this as u v transpose plus uh, the difference between this and u v transpose, which is just u times sigma minus sigma lambda t over lambda t minus i v transpose. And this is going to be our w. Okay. Now, for this to be a valid subgradient, this w has to have operator norm less than or equal to 1. And it has to be orthogonal to um, the left and right singular factors. So I'm going to, we'll just check it has operator norm less than or equal to 1. And then I'll leave it up to you guys to check that this is actually orthogonal to left and right singular factors. So why does it have operator norm less than or equal to 1? What is the operator norm of this guy w? It's the largest singular, um, largest singular value of this matrix. What's the largest singular value of this matrix? First of all, is this a proper SVD of this for, for W? It is, right? Because this is diagonal. So this is actually the SVD of W. We've written it down. What is sigma minus sigma lambda, uh, lambda t? That's, that's something that's 0 um, whenever uh, no, sorry. This is something that's equal to lambda t, right? Um, so sigma minus sigma lambda t is just equal to lambda t in its first, you know, k components, and then afterwards it's um, it's equal to just the rest of the Singular values, right? Because in the first k components, if we've soft thresholded these, um, 
by subtracting off lambda and they were positive, then we just got um, sigma 1, 1 minus lambda, and sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 1, 1 minus lambda is just lambda. Or in this case, the level is lambda t. After that, the, the soft threshold inversions are to zero, so that we just retain the original single, singular factors. So when we divide by lambda t, um, this thing over lambda t is just going to be equal to 1 in the first, say, k components, and then it's going to be equal to other stuff afterwards, this stuff over lambda t. But these things we know are actually all smaller than lambda t. So these entries are all less than 1. So we'll call it a, etc. All these entries are less than 1. And so now what are the diagonal entries of this matrix? Well, they're going to be 0 because I have 1s minus the 1s here. And then they're going to be something that's less than 1 in the absolute value because I have 1 minus something less than 1. So all of the singular values of this matrix are either zeros or something less than 1, which means that the operator norm, it's going to be the, the maximum entry of the diagonal entry of this matrix, it is indeed going to be less than 1. Okay, so that's something we can just verify directly from the form of, of sigma t. All right, and like I said, I'm, what's that? K, K was just the number of things that, that survived thresholding. It's just a placeholder. So these are the number of diagonal elements that were bigger than lambda t. Okay, so it's like, uh, well, actually, that's an interesting point. What's the rank of, what is, what is the rank of this matrix? It's just k. Okay, so that, that's uh, kind of an example for how we might derive a prox operator. We did almost all of it. The only part we didn't do was essentially prove that um, these are valid subgradients, but you'll do that in the homework, like I said. This is a pretty, one of the more sophisticated prox operators to derive, but now you have it at your disposal because anytime you have any problem where it's a smooth part plus um, trace norm, you know how to, how to apply proximal gradient. So let's just get through the steps of the algorithm. Then that'll be the end, and we'll have to pick up the last bit next time. So through some, you know, some mathematics there involved in the trace norm and subgradient optimality, we've proved that the um, proximal operator is just matrix soft thresholding, which requires an SVD, by the way. That's why it's expensive, right? Because we have to compute an SVD, then we have to zero out or soft threshold its singular values. So it's quite an expensive prox operator in comparison to the L1 norm. Nevertheless, we have now an algorithm for, for um, the matrix completion problem, which is at every step to add the minus gradient times t to your current estimate b, and then do matrix soft thresholding. Well, this is actually quite simple because um, you can check that the gradient is Lipschitz with constant 1. This is the gradient. It's just a linear function. It's either a linear function or it's 0, right? So this is Lipschitz with constant 1. That means we can take t equals 1 here in these iterations. And when we plug in t equals 1, you'll see we get py of lambda plus b minus p omega of um, b. And b minus p omega of b is the projection of b onto the unobserved set. So we're just going to define that to be p omega perp of b, which means that we just zero out all the entries that are observed, and we leave all the unobserved, all the entries outside of omega untouched. And so here's the update. We take all the entries of uh, y, yij that were observed. We add in all of the entries in our estimate beta that are off of omega. That forms a new matrix, right? Those are complementary sets. We have zero, the zeros from, I mean, the, the observed set from y, the unobserved set from b. That's a, our estimate. And then we actually enforce it to be low rank by soft thresholding it in the matrix fashion, so taking the SVD of this and killing some of its singular values. That makes beta plus. This is called soft impute. It's a, I'd say it's probably one of the simplest methods for matrix completion. It's also surprisingly effective. Um, so this soft impute algorithm is actually proposed by some authors who derived it on first principles, because like I said, these are pretty, I think, natural steps, and never tied it to proximal gradient. So they proved that it had a certain convergence rate. They proved a bunch of properties about it. 
But in hindsight, all they're doing was proximal gradient. So we actually know kind of all of these things for free just from our analysis for proximal gradient. All right, we're a few minutes over. We have only a few more slides left on proximal gradient. We'll get to those next time.